Coming in at number 10, we've got Wolverine vs Wolverine from Marvel's Age of Ultron event. Now, as a mutant that's been cloned once, twice, or even several dozen times, Wolverine is certainly no stranger to having to cross claws with a version of himself. However, the time traveling shenanigans involved in stopping Ultron's complete takeover of Earth has to be one of the most notable. After making the incredibly difficult decision to travel back in time and kill the creator of Voltron, Hank Pym, Wolverine found out that the new Pymless future he'd created was even worse than the one he'd left and was immediately attacked by this apocalyptic future's version of Wolverine. Then again, considering the entire reason this version of Earth was now destroyed was partially due to a war with the Skrulls, we can maybe understand why the future Wolverine would be a bit suspicious of any newcomers. At number 9, we have our very first clone of the list with the battle between Thor and his cyborg copy, Ragnarok. During the events of Civil War, the real Thor was presumed dead after saving Asgard from destruction. As a means of reinforcing his side of the conflict, Tony Stark wound up using a strand of Thor's hair to create a half-flesh, half-machine clone of the fallen Avenger. A plan that went horribly off the rails when the cloned Thor, dubbed Ragnarok, killed the superhero Goliath and converted many heroes on to Captain America's side. When the real Thor was eventually resurrected, he wasted little time in completely dominating and destroying his copy, proving once and for all who the true God of Thunder is. Coming in at number 8, we've got another Avenger fighting a less than worthy variant with Captain America vs Hydra Cap. After an alternate Steve Rogers that had grown up as a devout follower of Hydra wound up taking over the entire United States in a particularly controversial Marvel storyline, the world was overjoyed to see the real Steve Rogers return and finally put this imposter in his place. Literally bursting forth out of a shard of the cosmic cube, the true True Steve Rogers was able to fight back against this twisted version of everything he stood for and eventually break his armor down with a little help from the worthiness deciding Mjolnir. At number 7, we've got to go with the classic storyline of Hulk versus the Maestro. Bruce Banner often has to face off against different mental versions of the Hulk inside his head, but this alternate version of himself from a post-apocalyptic future is the real deal. Naming himself Maestro after conquering what remains of America following a nuclear winter, this version of the Hulk has become far stronger than the Hulk's usual starting strength, with years of sucking up deadly radiation only improving his ferocity and power. When the real Hulk encountered this warlord version of himself, the only way he was able to finally come out on top was by literally warping the maestro back in time to be killed by the same gamma bomb that created the Hulk back in the 60s. I'd say that's a little bit of overkill though. Coming in at number 6, we have the Battle of the Batmen with Tim Drake versus Jason Todd. Now, the many Robins of the DC Universe are no strangers to occasionally squabbling amongst themselves, but when both Tim Drake and Jason Todd are dressed as Batman and beating the hell out of each other in the middle of the Batcave, well... That's just dramatic enough to earn a spot on this list. During a period of time in which Bruce Wayne is believed to have been killed by Darkseid, Jason Todd had taken over the cowl and cape and become a much deadlier Dark Knight. Not wanting Bruce's no killing rule to be abandoned, the Bat family tried many ways to get Jason to stand down, before finally culminating in a Batman vs Batman battle that shook the Bat family to its core. Coming in at number 5, we have Barry Allen versus the future Flash. In a possible future where Barry Allen is distraught at where his life has led and feels like the speed force is on the verge of collapsing, this version of Barry begins heading back in time to kill off his rogues gallery and eventually prevent the death of Wally West. This brings him into direct conflict with the main DC timelines Barry Allen and eventually the future Flash decides he'll use his past self as a battery to attempt to go even further back in time. 
Talk about some real self-hatred going on there, Barry. Maybe you should stop messing with the timeline for just a little while. Coming in at number four, we have Superman versus his six-dimensional future self, which just might be the most comic book thing I have ever said out loud. When the entire DC multiverse was at stake due to Lex Luthor and his followers attempting to break the source wall and free the dark goddess Perpetua, Superman and the Justice League were forced to open a doorway to the mythical sixth dimension, where only the creators of the multiverse could usually exist. After passing through the doorway, Superman seemed to return as an older, wiser, and more enlightened version of himself, a hypothetical perfect Superman. However, this all turned out to be a ruse by Perpetua's son, the World Forger, leading to the real Superman and his futuristic doppelganger to battle it out at the very edge of the universe. Man, what a bummer that this guy's awesome beard turned out to not be real after all. At number three, we've got the original clone saga, the story of Peter Parker versus Ben Riley. For years, the biggest question in all of Spidey comics was who is the real Peter Parker? The hero we've been following for years, or this new character originally introduced as Ben Riley? Also going under the name of the Scarlet Spider, these two characters would go back and forth from friends to enemies and everything in between, with Ben even taking the main Spider-Man label for a while as they struggled with questions of identity and who was behind their complicated lives. That's some clone drama at its very finest. Coming in at number two, we have Mr. Fantastic versus The Maker. Now, most fights on this list have been between two variants of a character that have only briefly encountered one another, or eventually were able to reconcile their differences. But in the case of The Maker, this is a version of Reed Richards that is just as smart and cunning as his regular heroic self, but using that intellect for his own twisted goals again and again. Not only are these two versions of Reed Richards directly opposed to one another, but their greatest battles have involved the fate of each of their respective universes, with the Maker still dead set on finding a way to restore the ultimate universe to its former glory. And finally, at number one, we have Deadpool vs. Evil Deadpool, a matchup that definitely has the weirdest origin story compared to anyone else on this list. Following an encounter with a love-struck stalker superfan, Deadpool searches her house to discover that she's actually been collecting discarded body parts that he'd lost over the years in her freezer. Weirded out by this turn of events, Deadpool dumps all of the parts into a dumpster, not realizing once they thaw that all of the body parts will Frankenstein together because of his healing factor, forming a new, even more hideous, Evil Deadpool. With this Deadpool wanting to accomplish evil feats that even the real Deadpool wouldn't consider, it's not long before the two super violent copies are battling it out. Coming in at number 10, we have Supergirl vs. Dark Supergirl. Hmm, I wonder which of these two is the evil one. During a battle between Lex Luthor and Supergirl while he was wearing one of his infamous war suits, Lex attempted to turn Supergirl into a Kryptonian slave by hitting her with a surprise blast of black kryptonite energy. Instead of corrupting Kara's personality directly, however, it wound up splitting her in two, creating a dark doppelganger that possessed all of Supergirl's powers, but with her memories twisted into believing she was sent to conquer Earth rather than protect it. This dark Supergirl was strong enough to turn on Lex Luthor and fight him to a standstill on Earth's moon, and it was only through the combined might of the real Supergirl and the Justice League that dark Supergirl was able to be defeated and reunited with the rest of her consciousness. At number 9, we've got to go with Wolverine vs. Laura Kinney, aka X-23. Following many failed attempts to revitalize the Weapon X project that wound up giving the original Wolverine his adamantium skeleton, the project shifted direction to attempt to clone Wolverine directly. Unfortunately, 22 failed attempts later, the scientists involved realized that the Y chromosome in their genetic sample was damaged. Thus, a female clone labeled X-23 was finally successfully born. This clone would have an extremely traumatic childhood as she was molded into the weapon that the project wanted her to be, and would eventually finally battle with the original Wolverine outside of the X Mansion. And while this clone would eventually take up her own name of Laura Kinney, and even take up the Wolverine mantle as a new hero, we'll never forget when Laura and Logan first clashed claws. 
Coming in at number eight, we've got a mental battle of the Goliaths with the Incredible Hulk versus Devil Hulk. Deep within the recesses of Bruce Banner's mind, a Hulk personality representing all of his hatred and self-loathing is locked away, desperately searching for a way to access the real world as many other Hulk personalities have done in the past. During an incident in which Bruce and his Savage Hulk and Joe Fixit personalities ventured within his own mind, it took the combined might of all three of them to prevent the Devil Hulk from escaping and becoming an unstoppable monster in the real world. At number 7, we've got Superman vs. Ultraman. Hailing from the Dark Earth 3, where many of the DC Universe's heroes and villains find themselves with completely different moral alignments, Ultraman is a selfish and twisted version of the Man of Steel who leads his world's crime syndicate rather than the Justice League. With Kryptonite making him more powerful and his only weakness being the Earth's yellow sun, Ultraman stands for everything that Clark Kent is opposed to, and every time the crime syndicate attempts to invade the mainstream DC Universe, you just know there's going to be a long, drawn out battle between these twin sons of Krypton. Coming in at number 6, we have the Pink Power Ranger versus the Ranger Slayer. Yes, the Power Ranger comic books have been going on long enough now that they've started to delve into alternate universe crossovers, and one of the most exciting new villains to result from this plot development is the assassin known as the Ranger Slayer. An alternate version of the Pink Ranger Kimberly, the Ranger Slayer was born after the deaths of the Red and Blue Rangers led to this Kimberly's bow being corrupted with dark energy. The second she picked up her weapon, she was corrupted into a new villain known as the Ranger Slayer, a villain that couldn't even be defeated by her normal universe self, but had to be freed from her dark spell by the real Kimberly shattering her corrupted bow. Ah, comic book logic, you really gotta love it. At number 5, we've got Miles Morales versus Miles Morales versus Miles Morales versus Miles Morales? That's right, it's a four-way battle this time, as just like the original Spider-Man, Miles Morales wound up getting his own clone saga. When a villain known as the Assessor experimented on Miles' spider-modified DNA, he was able to create three rapidly aging clones, each with their own quirks and variations on Miles' base powers. Going by the names of Shift, Salim, and Mind Spinner, these three clones weren't inherently evil, but were dead set on finding a cure to their rapid clone degeneration, a miscommunication that wound up bringing them into conflict with the real Miles Morales. Coming in at number 4, we've got Beast vs. Dark Beast. And unlike the Dark Supergirl entry on this list, this evil doppelganger is unfortunately here to stay. Originally hailing from the alternate timeline known as the Age of Apocalypse, this version of Hank McCoy was a twisted mad scientist working under the tutelage of Mr. Sinister, striving to create the most powerful mutants possible no matter what the cost. Although this messed up future would be prevented by the X-Men, Dark Beast was wily enough to find a way into the main Marvel Universe and avoid his existence being erased. Ever since, he's been a persistent thorn in the X-Men's side, and a particular burden on Beast, who would much rather that someone didn't use his intellect for evil. At number 3, we've got the Battle of the Spider-Clones with Ben Reilly vs. Kane. While I already featured Peter Parker and his clone duplicate Ben Reilly during part 1 of this series, Kane is actually the very first Spider-Man clone ever created. Unfortunately, being a prototype means that Kane is mentally unstable and physically scarred, with his cells rapidly degenerating as a side effect of the cloning process. Kane was a major enemy to Ben Reilly for many, many years, attempting to frame him for murder and manipulating his life for Kane's own benefit. However, both of these clones would eventually find their own destinies as anti-heroes, and giving the Marvel Universe even more web-slingers to worry about. Coming in at number 2, we've got Cable vs. X-Man, two characters that are kind of the same person, but also kind of not in a weird comic booky way. Also hailing from the Age of Apocalypse timeline, X-Man, also known as Nathaniel Grey, is the son of this dimension's Cyclops and Jean Grey. Cable, meanwhile, is from a different alternate future, and his parents are Cyclops and a clone of Jean Grey. 
You see, totally not confusing. While Cable's telekinetic abilities are hampered by the techno-organic virus that gives him his unique appearance, X-Man is a full-fledged Omega-level mutant, capable of altering energy and matter at a massive scale. With both of them being extremely powerful in their own ways due to their vastly different upbringings, these two heroes cause quite a commotion every time they clash. And finally, at our number one spot is one of the biggest comic book battles in recent memory, Batman versus the Batman Who Laughs. With all of the Joker's insanity combined with all of Bruce Wayne's strategic brain and intellect, the Batman Who Laughs is one of the scariest villains the DC Universe has ever seen. Hailing from the dark multiverse, a place where the evilest and most cursed worlds are doomed to die, the Batman Who Laughs invaded the regular DC multiverse with an army of equally twisted Batman and threatened to destroy all of creation. In fact, the threat posed by the Batman Who Laughs and his Dark Knights was so grave that the real Batman actually had to team up with his own Joker to wind up defeating their DNA digivolved foe. Number 10, Batman vs Red Hood. During the story Under the Red Hood, Batman ends up face to face with Red Hood, aka Jason Todd. For years, Jason Todd was thought dead, but at this point it's been revealed that he he is in fact alive, and has been for some time. Jason decides to return to Gotham and seek out Batman as the vigilante Red Hood. However, there is a great conflict between the two, with Batman fighting Red Hood during their first encounter and later condemning Jason for his brutal form of justice and his willingness to kill those who stand against him. When Batman attempts to persuade Jason to rejoin him, this has the opposite effect, only turning Jason more towards the darker path. Jason gives Batman an ultimatum, kill the Joker or kill him. You see. Jason wasn't mad that Batman wasn't able to save him years ago, or that he didn't come looking for him after his seeming death. He was mad that the Joker was still alive, with Batman allowing him to go on living, despite what he'd done. Batman refuses, however, to kill Jason or the Joker, instead preventing Jason from shooting the villain. As a result, Jason becomes an enemy of Batman, and a villain in general. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving what we do here at Top 10 Nerd, why not show us you love us by hitting that subscribe button? Do it, I dare you. Number 9, Guardians of the Globe and Invincible versus Machine Head, Hired Goons, and Battle Beast. This has to be one of the most brutal fights we've seen thus far in the animated series Invincible, though fans of the comics know that this really is just the beginning. Mark Grayson as Invincible hoped to help one of Machine Head's hired goons, Titan, escape his criminal life. However, in the end, he was betrayed by Titan, who only wanted to take his boss's title and position. And Invincible, as well as the Guardians of the Globe, also ended up getting their butts handed to them by Machine Head's hired muscle, Battle Beast, to boot. Which I mean, fair enough, Battle Beast is nuts. Number 8, The Suicide Squad versus Starro the Conqueror. Because I mean, come on, you know I gotta do it. You know I gotta do it. Starro the Conqueror is one of the most destructive forces we've seen in the DCEU, and also maybe has one of the saddest stories besides, in terms of his origins. That's right, for this one, we are pivoting over to the DC Extended Universe, the name for their cinematic universe, and James Gunn's The Suicide Squad. Here, Starro the Conqueror is an alien life form that was basically kidnapped from outer space, brought to Earth, and experimented on by the Thinker. Over time, he has grown to be massive and, of course, quite angry at his captors. When the Suicide Squad are tasked with uncovering the secret of Project Starfish and destroying the base that houses it, they end up freeing Starro, causing mass destruction in Corto Maltese. They defeat Starro in the end, but some of them, of course, die along the way, and the amount of property damage and casualties as a result of this fight is pretty immense. Number 7, Wakanda versus Namor the Sub. Mariner. This fight targeted the entire often mostly heroic nation of Wakanda. And what's more, it was another supposed hero, or at least anti-hero, doing the damage. This all went down during the Avengers vs X-Men event, with the Avengers said to have taken up refuge in Wakanda, and Namor being possessed by a piece of the Phoenix Force, belonging at the time to the Phoenix Five, he decided to use his power to draw them out. How did he do this? Well, with a tidal wave that destroyed much of Wakanda, killed or hurt many of its people, and ended up causing a split between everyone's favorite couple, T'Challa's Black Panther and Aurora Monroe's Storm. Thanks for that, Namor. Namor! Number 6, Great Ring of Arako versus Uranos. This one was pretty brutal for Arako, and it was a surprisingly quick fight. This all went down during the event Avengers vs X-Men vs Eternals Judgment Day, or AXE for short. With the revelation to the world that the mutants were capable of resurrection, new Prime Eternal Druig realized he could use this information to his advantage, and to strengthen his rule. He decided to label 
the mutants as deviants, seeing their ability to control life and death as excess deviation. Labeling it as such, he went to war with them and was even convinced to release eternal criminal Uranos. Uranos is known for being one of the most effective warlords around, removing any and all who basically stand in his path and eradicating them and whatever race they belong to or world they belong to completely. When Druig unleashes Uranos on Mars, now known as Planet Araco, the ruling government known as the Great Ring does not stand a chance against them. I feel like within the first 5 or 10 minutes of that fight, they're pretty much defeated as well, which is pretty crazy because they're like all omega level mutants. Number 5, Marvel Universe versus the Progenitor. This one was quite the doozy. Remember how we were talking about AXE? Well, doesn't end with Druig unleashing Uranos. Although Uranos plays a key role and is a massive threat in this story, he isn't even the main antagonist here. That role is actually taken by the Progenitor. The Progenitor is the Rebel Eternal's response to Druig's reign and his attack on mutants. They decide the best way to stop him is to resurrect a celestial, creating their own version of one of the cosmic gods, and giving it a moral system which would actually help the celestial to see their side of the argument, thereby defeating and deposing Druig. This however does not work out as planned. With the help of the Avengers and mutant geneticist Mr. Sinister, the Eternals create their god, but it turns out that the progenitor is less interested in judging solely Druig and more interested in judging all of Earth. And if found lacking, the progenitor promises that within 24 hours, Earth will be destroyed as a result. And after the 24 hours are up, and it does indeed judge Earth to be unworthy, it begins to deliver on its promise, killing many of Marvel's most prominent and most powerful heroes. Number 4, Superman versus the Joker and Harley Quinn. This one definitely ended in major disaster as it was the event that ended up resulting in the Injustice timeline here. And we all know how that ended up. Awfully. This was a really one sided fight, too, as Superman didn't really stand a chance against the Joker and Harley Quinn's machinations. Which sounds weird to say considering it's Superman, but that's what happened. In this world, they manipulated Superman into thinking that he was fighting Doomsday, when in reality, he was actually fighting Lois Lane, you know, his one true love. Discovering only too late what he'd really done, the realization of what they'd made him do basically broke Superman. He would end up killing the Joker in cold blood and turning into a tyrant as a result of this targeted and gross mostly successful attack on Supes and his family. Number 3, Marvel Universe vs Onslaught When Marvel's heroes came up against Onslaught, it took all of them banding together, even joined by some villains, to stand a chance against him. And even then, this seemingly was not enough, with many heroes sacrificing themselves in order to defeat Onslaught for good. At first, we were made to believe that these heroes were dead gone for good. That's how deadly the threat of Onslaught was. People were willing to lay their lives on the line. Fortunately, that's not exactly what happened, and instead, Franklin Richards, the child of Reed Richards, aka Mr. Fantastic, and Susan Storm Richards, aka Invisible Woman of the Fantastic Four, was able to save the day. Despite his youth, Franklin at the time had immensely powerful reality warping powers, and used them without really even being super aware of it, kind of subconsciously, to safely stow Earth's heroes away in a pocket dimension. Onslaught would be defeated the heroes saved, and shortly after, they would make their return to the main reality of Earth 616. But still, we thought they were all dead, so it was a pretty big cost, it seemed at the time. Number 2, Captain America vs Iron Man. When these two fought just as the 2015 Secret Wars event was starting up in Avengers issue number 44, during Time Runs Out, it was literally a fight that ended with the destruction of the multiverse. I don't know how much more disastrous that can get. While Captain America and Iron Man weren't the ones behind the destruction of the multiverse, they also weren't doing much to help prevent it at this point either. This fight had been a long time coming at this point, considering all the pent up frustration and tension that had been growing between these two over the years, especially after the events of Civil War. The thing is, there will always be room in the comics for a fight between Cap and Tony, because, well, they're both so different in terms of their ideologies. Unless I guess we are in the reality of Earth 3490, where Steve Rogers and a female version of Tony named Natasha Stark are actually married. Although, I'm sure even those two fight, right? Marital fights. Number 1, DC Universe versus Perpetua. Perpetua is one of the greatest threats the multiverse has ever faced when it comes to DC Comics. And when our famed heroes first faced her, guess what? They lost. I know, it's shocking. That doesn't usually happen in comics. Perpetua's goal was to reshape the multiverse in her own darker image. After she broke free from the source wall, she set up to do just this, with the help of her allies, Batman Who Laughs and Barbados. In the end, Perpetua would be defeated, even being betrayed by one of her own, with Batman Who Laughs usurping her and taking her power for himself. 
health. But still, the temporary threat of a new world where Perpetua ruled was pretty awful. And for a while, she kind of did win, so yeah. Number 10, Pat and Parnell versus Moreland. This one goes down pretty quickly in the comics, but we also get a lot of time to get attached, or afraid more like, of Pat and Parnell before he meets his end, at least. Pat and Parnell is an alternate of Spider Man, but he couldn't be introduced at a worse time in the comics, in terms of his own self preservation. He is introduced at a time when Moreland and the inheritors are running rampant across the multiverse, killing spider totems. As such, just when Parnell's story seems to be reaching its horrifying conclusion, with him becoming a spider human monster hybrid and chasing after the girl of his dreams, who he seems to now be inclined to possibly murder horribly, Moreland shows up. And he does what he does best kill this spider totem, making Pat and Parnell's story very short lived. Which is good for his neighbor Sarah Jane in the moment, but unfortunate for us readers, as he was a super creepy villainous Spider Man alternate, and personally, I loved him. And friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Top 10 Nerd, please click that subscribe. Do it, do it, do it! Number 9, Joker vs. Red Skull. Oddly enough, despite being from two very different worlds, these two fought one another in the comic Batman and Captain America, a joint comic venture from both Marvel and DC, written by and with inks by John Byrne. While Batman and Captain America teamed up in the comics, also swapping sidekicks, so do their enemies, the Joker and Red Skull. However, when the Joker learns of Red Skull's bizarre patriotism and ideology, he swears to fight against him. On learning of the Skull's allegiance and and Red Skull's offer for Joker to join him and his people, Joker responds by stating, I may be a criminal lunatic, but I'm an American criminal lunatic. Despite his strong stance against the Red Skull and what he represents, however, Joker is pretty easily defeated here in this fight, being knocked out by one of Skull's goons before being dragged onto the plane to be taken back to Germany. Of course, they never do make it there, and Joker gets the last laugh in the end. Well, really, the heroes get the last laugh in the end. But like many fights involving the standard Joker, this one against Red Skull is fairly one sided. Number 8, Green Goblin versus Sin Eater. I think the really cool thing about this fight is that in defeating Norman Osborn, Sin Eater also freed him. For Sin Eater, defeating a villain usually has to do with absolving them of their sin, which was exactly what happened here when Sin Eater finally caught up to Norman Osborn. Taking his gun, he fired and shot Norman directly, thereby removing his sin from him. Norman begged and pleaded to not be absolved because he claimed he wanted to beat his own demons by himself. But it turns out that this was likely not really Norman talking but the Green Goblin who probably was just pleading to try and maintain his sense of evil. Number 7, Mephisto versus Khonshu. While Mephisto doesn't end up as being permanently defeated, Khonshu with his avatar Moon Knight still manages to kill a hefty number of Mephistos. It turns out there are a bunch of different alternates so Mephisto is able to just kind of like keep coming, but Khonshu with stolen powers of the Avengers and the help of Moon Knight ends up defeating a hundred Mephistos in one day. Which is wild, that's a lot of Mephistos, one is honestly a lot. And if you're wondering why Khonshu is being considered a villain here, it's because during this story arc, Age of Khonshu, he was actually kind of revealed to be one, acting in the name of justice but really taking over the world himself and then turning it into kind of like his own Egyptian underworld in the name of defeating Mephisto. Number 6, Doctor Doom versus Morgan Le Fay. Doom is often one who believes he is more powerful than all. And in most cases, he's usually right. Possessing a brilliant mind, an extremely powerful will, and also being skilled in the use of magic. However, even with being a former student of Morgan Le Fay's, even his magic prowess is no match for her own. When Morgan learns that in the future her student and lover Victor will betray her, she decides to strike first. She travels through time to kill him, and although he attempts to stand against her, she very nearly succeeds in defeating him for good. But even though the Dark Avengers do come to stop her, the initial battle here is quick and painful for Doom before he ends up being rescued. Number 5, Killer Croc vs Bane. Back in Batman issue 489, two heroes known for their strength and sometimes monstrous nature fought one another. And while they may have seemed more evenly matched on paper, one of them made quick work of the other. We are talking about the fight between Bane and Killer Croc which happened in the pages of Batman back in the 1990s. While initially Killer Croc seems confident in this fight, things quickly turns south after Bane breaks his arm. From there, Bane continues to basically kick his butt and leaves him knocked out and bleeding amongst a pile of toys in the Eden Park Mall. The crazy thing was that Bane and Croc didn't even really fight because they had beef, but more because Bane wanted to face Batman. However, Bane leaves after discovering that the Batman he's come across here is not the true Batman, but John Paul Valley. Number 4, Ishmael Gregor versus Black Adam. This one comes to us from the recent DC film released exclusively in theaters, Black Adam. The initial fight 
between these two characters is a fast and brutal one, thanks to Black Adam's rage. In this world, Black Adam is more pitched as an anti-hero, but in the comics, he has been known as a straight up villain before. Although right now, I would say in the comics, he's also more of an anti-hero, so kind of makes sense. Still, even in the DCEU, this is a guy who has god tier powers and who just straight up kills people who get in his way. In the case of Ishmael Gregor, he is the descendant of Black Adam's oldest enemy, the King of Kondok, who once oppressed his own people in search of greatness. When Ishmael seems to be trying to follow in his ancestors' footsteps and also kidnaps the son of Adriana Tomas, Amon, both of whom are Teth Adam's allies, Black Adam loses it, emitting a powerful blast of electric energy that defeats Ishmael instantly. While this defeat is swift, it turns out that it's not permanent, however, as this may have been part of Ishmael's plan all along. This one comes from a super random place, but is a pretty intense fight between what are likely the two main baddies of the MCU thus far. In the comics, Avengers Mech Strike issue number 4, Thanos is brought into this fight to face Kang, who the entire Avengers are basically up against. Unfortunately, despite Thanos' strength and brilliance, even he cannot defeat the Master of Time. All it takes is for Kang to lay his hands on Thanos and force him to experience the power Kang holds over time itself. He ages Thanos rapidly with his touch to the point that Thanos is no more than a skull, which is a creative way to kill him considering that Thanos was boasting of taking Kang's skull for his own trophy following their fight. <laughs> Kang doesn't even plan to keep Thanos' skull either, tossing it on the ground and saying he doesn't need souvenirs to keep warm memories in his heart. It's kind of a weird thing to say when you kill someone, warm memories, but you know. The Avengers beat him back after this, but it's an impressive show of strength from Kang. Number 2, Joker vs Poison Ivy One of the most brutal fights in comics comes unsurprisingly from the world of Injustice, though more specifically we're talking about Injustice Year Zero, issue number 8. Here Poison Ivy pays the Joker a visit to get revenge for the years of mistreatment towards his then ex, Harley Quinn. Ivy is inspired to do this after Harley reveals that she secretly had his daughter, and Ivy warns the Joker that if he ever hurts Harley again, she'll kill him. Despite the Joker threatening Ivy throughout this fight, it's very clear who has the real power between the two of them here. Number 1, Geist vs Magneto. Geist vs Magneto has to be one of my favorite all-time short-lived and brutal villain vs villain fights. Though really, between them, it's pretty apparent that Geist is the real villain here, I think. Magneto ends up doing his best to catch Geist and runs into him after he escapes punishment in Terra Verde in the late 80s Wolverine series. Magneto lures Geist out with a little mechanical toy and make short work of him. While his fate isn't explicitly shown on panel, considering that Geist is a cyborg and Magneto is the master of magnetism, we can imagine how brutal this fight would be and based on what we do see of what happens to the decoy robot toy, I think we know what's gonna happen there. Number 10, Taskmaster vs Hyperion. This one is wild, especially when you consider the beating the Taskmaster was allowing himself to take just to get this fight done. And yet he did manage to get it done, and impressively so. We get to learn about how he actually had this one in the bag through flashbacks we are shown during the fight, where it's revealed that Taskmaster's preparation was the key. Now it might seem weird that I'm considering Taskmaster to be the hero in this case, but based on what we learn about Phil Coulson's Squadron Supreme in the 2021 Heroes Reborn event, and you know, that whole thing with Mephisto, it really does make sense based on that. In the Taskmaster series in issue number 2, Taskmaster is working with Nick Fury to clear his name, but Tony Masters has to do something for Fury first. He needs to collect the kinesic signatures of three important individuals, one of whom is Phil Coulson. But to get to him, he has to go through Hyperion. And in order to do that, he has to first bring Hyperion's guard down, in essence allowing Hyperion to punch his way through Taskmaster. Ouch. Taskmaster, through feigning a loss though, is able to get Hyperion to drop his guard enough to get a single powerful boomerang arrow shot out. A Hawkeye classic that is tipped with Hyperion's one weakness based on Fury's intel. Radioactive Argonite. Which is basically like Hyperion's like kryptonite, so yeah. Alright friends, before we move on to this next spot on our list, if you love what we do here at Top 10 Nerd, why not show us you love us by clicking that subscribe button. I know there's a lot of you out there that aren't subscribed. I'm looking at you. You're not subscribed. Go click it. Do it. I'm gonna wait. Okay, thank you. Number nine, Dream versus Karanzan. One of my favorite fights I've ever 
ever read in any book, comic or otherwise, happens in the Sandman series, where many of my favorite things happen in comics because it's one of my favorite stories of all time. If you've watched my videos on Nerd here regularly over the years, you may also know that this comic is one of my favorite stories of all time because anytime I can talk about it, I love to talk about it. The original comic, of course, from the 90s is what we're talking about here, and the fight that happens in it happens during the first arc in the series when Dream is tasked with reclaiming his symbols of office, namely here his helm, which it turns out is currently in the possession of a demon in hell. In order to get back his helm in the comics, he must do battle with and beat the demon currently in possession of it, one of Beelzebub's a demon named Karanzon. This battle is described as being the oldest game and is in essence a battle of imagination. One can lose through hesitation, inability to take up a solid defensive stance, and of course, lack of imagination. In the Sandman live action series, this is the battle we see that takes place instead between Lucifer and Dream. However, in the comics, it is Karanzon that conjures up the anti-life in the hopes of finally beating Dream. While initially Dream is badly beaten by Karanzon's move, he ends up winning in the end, proving himself really the ruler of imagination, as what else are dreams really, by conjuring up the concept of hope which obviously can be pretty much everything. Some people might not consider Lord Morpheus a superhero, but I would consider his tale overall to be one similar to that of a heroic epic. And for that reason, and his capacity to do great good, when he so chooses, I'm gonna include him here. Number 8, Moon Knight vs. Raul Bushman So many of the most brutal fights in comics I feel like come from the time period that this comic does, the early 2000s. One of the most edgy times other than the 90s. In Moon Knight issue number 2 from the 2006 volume, Volume, Moon Knight takes on and brutally defeats Raul Bushman. But even before we get to the brutal yet victorious literal face off moment, stakes are established here, with Moon Knight being pushed off of a rooftop and falling to his doom, or seemingly falling to his doom, smashing his knees as he goes, and therefore unable to get up to defend himself really when Bushman comes down to finish the job. Fortunately, Moon Knight has his crescent moon darts and uses these to bring Bushman down to his level so he can crawl over to him and finish the job. Number 7, Black Panther vs Namor Probably one of the most brutal fights I've ever seen on screen in the Marvel Cinematic Universe comes to us from the recent Black Panther sequel, Wakanda Forever. That's right, we're going to the MCU, baby! In this film, it is T'Challa's sister Shuri who takes up the mantle of Black Panther after her brother passes away, which was changed in the script after the real-world death of Chadwick Boseman, who initially played Black Panther, prince-turned-king T'Challa in the first film and in the MCU. Shuri here takes up the mantle as a last resort to reconnect with the family she has lost, but also because she knows it is the only way she will be able to fight against the newly introduced and complex antagonist in this movie, Namor, the Submariner, or Namor if you prefer. I love the way that it's said in this movie, Namor. When the two do come to blows, after Shuri does successfully recreate the heart-shaped herb and becomes Black Panther, Shuri also uses her smarts to take advantage of Namor's weaknesses, creating a device to dry him out, which she places in one of her ships and activates during the fight against the famed Talo Khan. During the fight, the airship crash lands on a desert looking beach. It looks real crispy down there, I gotta say. And the two continue their bloody fight, both almost dying as Shuri attempts to prevent Namor from getting back into the water. Through the course of their fight, Black Panther rips off one of Namor's ankle wings, which allows him to fly, and Namor at one point skewers her with a part of the wreckage. Or a spear, I'm not really sure what it is. It looks like a spear, but he also kind of grabs it from where like the wreckage was. Maybe there were spears on the ship. Who knows? Number six, Batman versus Reverse Flash. This fight was heart wrenching for so many reasons, and pretty much perfectly encapsulates the kind of fights I'm excited to highlight here on this list. Let me tell you. In Batman issue number 21 from the 2016 comic, part of the Button story, Batman is forced to fight against an enemy who pretty much completely outranks him, the Reverse Flash. We see him get brutally attacked, and while it seems like there is no way Batman can win here, we later learned that being the smart man that he is, Batman himself knew that, and so he kind of already won, simply by accepting the fact that if he fought directly, he would lose, and knowing that his best bet would actually be basically to stall until the Flash returned, which ended up being a successful and life-saving strategy, actually. Although, I mean, in the end, the Flash was still a little late, but it worked out, so yeah, and it was brutal, so it ranks. Number 5, Harley Quinn versus the Joker. Well, some still might think of Harley Quinn as a villain, 
one. This all happened, I would say, around the time of her turning point from kind of villain into heroes, kind of when it's all going down. And while the road has been long, I would say at this point in time, at the time of this recording right now, despite only a few years before being declared villain of the year, that Harley is more hero than villain right now in her history, so yeah. This fight happened, however, quite a while ago now, but Harley was still enjoying acting somewhat heroically, at least, as part of the Suicide Squad, and coming into her own really as a character, or continuing to come into her own, I would say. In Suicide Squad issue number 15, she faces off with the Joker in one of the most brutal fights I have ever read. And while the Joker technically kind of wins this fight, Harley wins the battle, managing to escape with her life after he locks her up and threatens to leave her there to starve to death with all the corpses of the supposed Harleys who came before her. There is so much about this fight that I cannot talk about in detail because we're on YouTube. But just trust me, it's it's just because it's also literally that brutal. So if you want to read a brutal fight, check it out. Number four, Spider-Man versus Green Goblin. This one ended in seeming death for both parties, and it doesn't get more brutal than that. Add in the fact that Peter Parker was also unmasked during the fight and had his loved ones and neighborhood watching him get basically beaten into oblivion, and it creates a pretty intense picture in your mind and in your heart. Or, well, yeah, I mean, you don't even really need to create a picture of it in your mind because this comes from the Ultimate Comics, and of course, they provide the pictures for you because it's a comic book. And what a brutal picture they do paint. This fight isn't just brutal in a physical sense, although it is also that, with Peter smashing a hulking green goblin with basically a semi truck at one point, but it's also brutal in the emotional sense, because it ends with Peter's apparent death. And I mean also goblins apparent death. But of course, I'm much less broken up about Green Goblin dying here. No one cares. <laughs> Norman, you deserved it. In fact, I kind of feel relieved at that part. While this wouldn't be the end end for either character, this battle is still one that stands out to me as one with heightened stakes, where the characters feel right on the precipice of death almost throughout, until they actually and tragically cross over to the other side. Number 3, Batman vs Superman. An iconic fight in the comics that made its way to the big screen. Granted, on the big screen, I don't I don't know how iconic this fight was for me, but at the end of the day, the fact that it even made it there just goes to show the impact it had on readers. This fight doesn't even come from the main continuity, hailing instead from Frank Miller's The Dark Knight Returns continuity of Earth 31. But it was so brutal and impactful that it was still incorporated into the main continuity, or the likely, I guess, to be former main continuity of the DCEU. Here, two heroes fight against one another, and one of them doesn't even have any powers to speak of. Batman, at this point is not only still powerless, but is also, or I guess was also, retired. He returns from retirement, however, and as a result, Superman is basically tasked with taking him out by the precedent. But Batman isn't prepared to go down without a fight, and a bloody, brutal, and desperate battle ensues between the two at the end of the story that we later find out Batman seemingly won in his own sly Batman way. While Batman seemingly dies and is unable to finish the fight, with the strain being too much on his heart and him collapsing. We later learn at the funeral that he is still alive and well, and that Clark may have even been in on this ploy. At the very least, he seems to be in on it by the end of the story. Number 2, Hawkeye vs the Liberators. As you'd expect, this list wouldn't be much without me diving into the world of the Ultimates. And what a perfect time for it too, as the Ultimate line is due to make its return in comics this year. There's so many brutal fights in the Ultimates, with Jonathan Hickman heading the return of the Ultimates line. Like many, I too am excited about this, so I thought why not dive back into some of the most brutal Ultimates fights we've ever witnessed. This one comes to us from before Jonathan Hickman's time working on the Line, but was delivered to us by the dynamic and often brutal duo of Mark Miller and Brian Hitch. And Brian Hitch will be returning, so fun facts. It does fit right in on this list because it's just that brutal. The fight happened after Hawkeye of the Ultimates team was kidnapped by the Liberators. After learning of what happened to his family and being mocked, tormented, and questioned, Hawkeye finally manages to strike back against his captors with the only weapon he has at the time, his fingernails. And we're not talking about Clint clawing his way out of this. Oh no, we are talking about him using his fingernails as projectiles when combined with his deadly accuracy, which basically allow him to take out an entire group of liberators and successfully escape. He kills people with his fingernails. Number 
one, Mara versus Aquaman. Mara and Aquaman are often presented as being romantic partners, and sometimes as a crime fighting Atlantean duo as well. However, this doesn't mean that they never fight. And during the Blackest Night, they actually had some pretty good reason to. At that time, Aquaman had been possessed by the Black Lanterns joining their forces, and Mara was driven into a rage by the death of the last standing family member she had, Tempest, causing her to become a Red Lantern. During one page in Green Lantern issue number 50 from the 2005 volume of that series, Mara takes on the deceased Arthur Curry, and when he attempts to win her over through what I can only describe as weird kind of empathy, I imagine trying to distract her from her rage by attempting to bond with her over the loss of their son. This however fails to work, and Mara frightens him off masterfully, responding, I never wanted children, before seemingly killing them both with her blood, which is a Red Lantern was transformed at the time into liquid napalm because that's how it be for Red Lanterns. Number 10, Invincible vs Conquest. Good. Ness. Invincible has a slew of fights that are extremely brutal and brilliant. I mean, their brutality is a huge part of what makes them so brilliant. This is a series that knows and understands the importance of creating stakes, both physical and emotional ones for its characters. While I considered talking about the fight between Mark and his dad Omni-Man on the first part of this list, or honestly any of the other amazing fights that happen in Invincible to be honest, as I said there are so many, I would like to specifically thank Von Soso for suggesting this one. This is the fight that happens between Conquest and Invincible. When Conquest first arrives on Earth and demands that Invincible take responsibility as the Viltrumite liaison stationed there to basically get the planet ready for conquering. Mark at this point has just gone through hell and back and basically blames himself for all of the terrible terrible things that have happened on Earth recently. So he's not really in a great mood and is filled with anger, resentment and sadness for all that he's lost, and decides to take on Conquest. Overall, honestly not a great move, which Mark learns once he finds out just how powerful Conquest is. Probably one of the toughest enemies he's ever faced at this point, which is kind of par for the course for Invincible because I feel like every time Mark faces someone he's like, well I've done a lot of things, and then he's always like, dang, how is this person even more powerful? How is that possible? Honestly it's saying something, because at this point in the story, Mark has faced like a lot of tough opponents, including a whole army made up of evil versions of himself. The fight gets even more brutal when Adam Eve comes in to help, having literally flown up off a hospital bed where she was currently healing herself to do so. And I know what you all are thinking, wow, Amanda, what a number 10 spot. This is a crazy fight. But uh, yeah, that's that's all part of the drawing you in because we got a lot more crazy fights coming up, even though this one might actually be one of our craziest. But wait for that number one spot. That one's wild. And friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Top 10 Nerd, be sure to show us by clicking that like button. Number nine, Deadpool versus Black Box and Black Tom. I still can't believe how close Deadpool came to dying in this fight. And the real crazy part is it wasn't even the villains really who put him in that situation. They were more like the catalysts for him putting himself in danger as he fought against them both. This one comes to us from Daniel Way's run on Deadpool which happened back in 2008. Here at one point Deadpool becomes cured of his mutation. With his healing factor gone, he is turned back into handsome Wade Wilson, but at the same time a big target is of course placed on his head when those he has royally pissed off in the past basically realize he's now very killable. Two people who end up coming for him are the villains Black Box and Black Tom. And to fight their fire, Deadpool decides to use some of his own fire, using literal fire, using a lighter and basically gasoline to create his own flamethrower. However, while he wins the fight, or while well, he survives the fight at least, I mean, can we call it, I would call it a win for Deadpool here, he ends up pretty badly injured after setting himself on fire during it. He gets a little too excited with that sort of gas station flamethrower he made, and also, you shouldn't do that at a gas station, as we learned <laughs> in that comic. Number 8, Superboy Prime versus The Darkest Knight. This one is brutal in a way that pulls at my heartstrings. This fight happens in the comic Dark Knight's Death Metal The Secret Origins. While the fight itself is pretty short, the emotional and character building implications for it are powerful. The emotional stakes here are high. Superboy Prime ends up facing off against The Darkest Knight in the hopes of defeating him and helping to basically save the multiverse. Now, while he doesn't completely succeed here, he does help turn the tides for his fellow heroes, and this story provides a great redemption arc for Superboy Prime, who was once a hero, basically turned into a massive villain, all because he suffered the heartache of losing his world. While facing off against the Darkest Knight, Superboy Prime is basically offered to be spared and even join up with the Knight's own army of Supermen. He sees a vision of a life he could have in the future where he is once more a hero, fighting alongside his other heroic colleagues if he decides to, you know, join up with the Darkest Knight 
kid who can give him that reality. However, he acknowledges that this would still not be the world he lost, noting that both his parents and Lori would still be absent here. Tempted, Superboy is grounded in reality suddenly by the reappearance of Crypto and ends up refusing the offer, fighting against the Darkest Knight and giving his life in doing so. While the battle is not finished yet, this is a crucial moment where the tides turn for our heroes, weakening the darkness and allowing the heroes to basically rise up and end up winning the day. It is then confirmed that Superboy Prime did indeed die as a result of fighting back, however, he either gets his world back through his journey into the afterlife or possibly through the multiverse's reconstruction following the resolution of death metal. So he's either dead and then he's brought back or he's dead and he's in the afterlife and he just kind of gets a little happy ending in the afterlife. Number 7. Dazzler vs Techmaster One of the most brutal things you can do to a character, we all know, is not to just throw them brutally across a room into a wall, but literally throw them so forcefully that it looks like they were simply drawn sideways in a fight. Like someone took that figure and rotated it, which is what happens in this comic. And I was like, wow, you know that's bad. Look at Dazzler go, she's literally like this. That's what happened to Dazzler when she faced off against Techmaster. Well, Techmaster is very much, I would say, a lesser known villain, having only appeared in about a handful of issues during his time in the comics, this fight still personally had me on the edge of my seat. Honestly, a lot of classic stories have me on the edge of my seat. I just feel like the suspense <laughs> just feels so heightened. While Dazzler usually pulls out all her bells and whistles in a fight, in this one, she has her special portable radio made by Reed Richards, Mr. Fantastic of the Fantastic Four, destroyed, and ultimately it comes down to basically kind of like fisticuffs, as Dazzler fights desperately for survival here. She does win and even almost causes the death of her opponent as he tumbles backwards and falls over a railing. However, her manager, Harry Osgood, manages to rush in at the last minute and save the villain from certain doom, and with his life saved, Techmaster basically decides to make peace with both his rival, Harry, and with Harry's talent, Alison Blair. So it all kind of works out in the end. Number 6. Thor vs. Kull Borson Also known as the Serpent and the God of Fear, Kull Borson is actually Thor's uncle. But that didn't stop these two from fighting one another. In fact, their fight was in essence destined to happen. It had to happen, and Thor was fated to die in this battle against his uncle. Odin had attempted to keep Thor safe from this prophecy by locking Kull away years ago. Kull was once actually the rightful ruler of Asgard, the Allfather. But Odin was forced to overthrow his brother after Kull became obsessed obsessed with striking fear into both the hearts of his enemies and even kind of his allies. Odin locked Kull away deep beneath the sea, hoping to keep him from ever becoming powerful enough to rise again after he learned that the serpent was prophesied to kill his son. However, even doing this could not prevent the prophecy from coming to pass. Eventually, Kull would rise up, powered by the fears of the people of Midgard, and choose his own champions, awarding them great power and each their own hammer. Thor would learn the truth of his uncle and with the Avengers do battle against him and his army, dying as predicted in the fight against his uncle, but fortunately defeating him too. However, this is also comics, so both Kull and Thor would eventually return, despite their epic showdown and its seemingly permanent results. Number 5. Punisher vs Wolverine I mean, these two are both superheroes, which is maybe what makes the fight so much more brutal. This one happened during Garth Ennis's and Derek Robertson's time on Punisher. Here Punisher and Wolverine end up in a kind of a reluctant team up or a team up gone wrong. I would say, when Wolverine questions Punisher's methods here. As a result, to prevent Wolverine from hunting him down, or at least to kind of like slow Wolverine down because, you know, he's pretty unkillable, Punisher resorts to all kinds of brutal tactics, including shooting Wolverine point blank in the face with a shotgun, allowing him to have his limbs basically sawed off, attacking him below the belt, and steamrolling him. Literally, Steam, he got steamrolled. He got a steamroller and he ran Wolverine over. Boy. Wolverine, of course, survives all this mistreatment, but it's still a brutal read and it's brutal in like a lot of ways to me. <laughs> Definitely a brutal fight. Number four, Batman versus the Joker. During the events of Endgame, no, not the Marvel Endgame, the comic story from Batman Endgame, Joker and Batman essentially end up trying to straight up murder one another. Or at least from a reader standpoint, that's basically what it seems like. Well, Joker at this point boasts of a healing factor that he claims he received hundreds of years before due to him being like basically this ancient being, far more ancient than Batman could have ever 
imagined. It's revealed through the course of their fight that, you know, this is probably not true, as Batman ends up successfully nullifying Joker's abilities in a way that reveals he only recently probably stumbled upon these powers and is definitely not as old as he claims and is just trying to mess with Batman, which honestly is the Joker way. Number three, Conan versus Cool and Goth. Just when you think Conan is going to take this one, the script gets flipped on you. This fight comes to us from Savage Avengers issue number 25, so good. Here, Cool and Goth faces off against Conan, who has come back to battle this fiend with the help of Kang. So you would think, with the impressive arsenal Kang has at his fingertips, that Conan would have this, right? Well, this is Cool and Goth, probably at his most powerful. He is the ruler of the world here, and even though Conan manages to maim him, he is not able to defeat him in hand to sorcery combat in this issue. Though of course there is a greater plan at work here, which ends up balancing the scales in Conan's favor in the end, but during this issue we don't really get to see that. Instead we focus on this bloody and gruesome battle fought with magic, energy weapons, armor, swords, symbiotes, and sharp fingernails. Deadly sharp, if I may add. Number two, Superman versus Doomsday. Superman and Doomsday have an iconic fight that many of us know from the famous story, Death of Superman. Now, if you've already watched my part one to this list, then this fight actually might remind you of another one I talked about over there. And if you haven't watched part one yet, be sure to do that after you finish this video because we have even more brutal superhero fights waiting for you over there. And if you have already watched it, you can guess below which fight I'm referring to as to which one is kind of similar to this Superman versus Doomsday fight. In this fight, Superman gives up his life to basically defeat Doomsday. This works with Doomsday perishing alongside Superman, ushering in the mourning period that would follow for Earth's greatest hero. But while there were those who could not believe what they were reading at the time that this story came out, this shocking moment at least would not end up being quite so frighteningly permanent, with Clark Kent later being resurrected. Even when you go back and read this, it's very like powerful, it's very emotional. Number one, Miracle Man versus Kid Miracle Man. Whew. This is a brutal one. Thanks to Michael Lavender for suggesting this one in the comments. I honestly do not think of Miracle Man often enough in my day to day. When I'm talking about comics, the Miracle Man is something that exists sort of near the back of my mind. So thank you so much for suggesting this one because now I get to talk about Miracle Man, which is just a great time. Talk about a character and a story and a fight. Rather, this one is honestly more of a massacre by the end. Less of a fight, more of just a brutal massacre. It's true that this is probably one of the most brutal superhero fights in all of comics history, I would say. And I'm actually like sad that I didn't include this on my part one, but you know what? It doesn't have to be the most brutal, it just had to be some brutal fights. So it's still good. And now we can come back to it over here and I can give it a top spot. We're going back to issue number 15 of Miracle Man to talk about this one from the 80s, although it was also reprinted in 2014. So if you see it looking a little bit more modern here, it might just be because we used that art in this video instead, which is actually also from Toddle Ben. So it's same artist, just they also redid it. And I would still say that I think this story has some of the most captivating and gruesome artwork I've ever seen in a comic, courtesy of Toddle Ben himself. In this tragic tale, Miracle Man is forced to fight against his former sidekick, Kid Miracle Man, who is now all grown up. Well, at least his Kid Miracle Man form is. Having lived in this form for years, he aged and also became insane. After transforming back into his human form of Johnny Bates initially, after years of being Kid Miracle Man who was now an adult and was basically crazed with power, he was traumatized to learn of all the horrible things that he had done in that form. So he was put into an orphanage with the hopes that, you know, being around other kids his age might help him to like drown out the voice of Kid Miracle Man that still plagued his mind and was kind of living in there. However, after being tormented by the other kids and suffering from SA, Johnny ended up saying the magical name of Miracle Man, transforming back into Kid Miracle Man and unleashing him on the world. Thousands, like 40,000 people were killed in the massacre that ensued after this transformation. And in the end, Miracle Man got lucky when Kid Miracle Man was forced to say the magical word once more to escape the pain of the injuries he'd suffered in battle. Also, this battle, I should admit, took like pretty much everyone to even just get him to turn back. So that's wild. Knowing that there was likely no way to save Johnny from his evil alter ego and therefore no way to prevent this kind of awful massacre from happening again, potentially in the future, Miracle Man was then forced to offer Johnny a sense of comfort, holding Johnny's head before he like basically crushes it in his hand. Ah! I have trauma just from reliving the story and rereading it. Uh. In at 10, Iron Man versus Mr. Sensitive. Oh boy, was 2000 for an interesting year, specifically because of Ecstatics number 24 from August of 2004. At a very young age, Guy Smith noticed his mutant powers. His skin
Ian would easily get irritated, and he always was in tremendous pain. Guy was raised in foster care after his parents died in a mysterious fire, and he underwent extensive martial arts training and mental disciplines to try to block out the pain that he felt. Professor X was able to provide Guy with a special sensory dampening suit, which didn't do anyone much good here, because in the context of this fight story, Tony and Mr. Sensitive are about to fight at what is aptly named the Church of Naked Truth, which was a church used by a cult of nudists. However, since they didn't want to offend the monks and they wanted to respect their religion, they each stripped down before the fight, laying all their cards out on the table, dare I say. Yeah, Tony throws grass at <laughs> Mr. Sensitive, and that's not even a joke. He throws grass at him to hurt him because he's not wearing his suit. It's weird, dude. Why was this a thing? In a nine, Doom above all. Doom Supreme's story history closely paralleled his mainstream counterpart's journey until a pivotal moment where he ascended to the mantle of Sorcerer Supreme and then thusly conquered his own reality. Indulging in sadistic torment of his foes for countless years, Doom Supreme eventually wearied off his cruel game and ventured into the past with the intent to exterminate the prehistoric Avengers. Upon concluding the hunt, Doom Supreme struck a deal with Mephisto Fisto, restoring the Watcher's eye to the orb as a favor, and then satisfied, he departed to unleash his wrath upon other Earths, leaving destruction in his wake. Unbeknownst to many, Doom Supreme had clandestinely gathered and subjugated various iterations of Doctor Doom from these prehistoric Earths. Utilizing Doom the Living Planet as his formidable base, he amassed a huge army of dooms. Poised to execute his grand design, the stage was set for an epic clash where the fate of countless realities hung in the balance. It was literally an army of dooms. And then Doom Supreme ruthlessly carved his path towards godlike supremacy. So yeah, um, if you want to read that, have fun with that. God damn, that was that was interesting. <laughs> and it ate Squirrel Girl vs. Galactus. Okay, I mean, when there's a whole series called The Unbeatable Squirrel Girl, you're gonna kind of think that she's gonna end up on this list, okay? Because god damn, look, I know you love her, but come on. The solo series of the same name debuted in January of 2015 and ran for eight issues and was relaunched in October of 2015 as part of Marvel's all new, all different branding and was published through November 2019, with 50 issues in that section, making for a total of 58. Both series were written by Ryan North, but in issue number 4 of volume 1, Squirrel Girl literally stops Galactus from coming after Earth by being friends with him. I mean, come on, you're literally unable to sit there and tell me that th this shouldn't be on the list. Bro, she didn't even have to fight him, for God's sakes. That's insane. She just talked the devourer of worlds into not devouring a world. Come on. Plus, like I said, I know you all love Squirrel Girl, okay? I might not have been here for a while. Okay, I, I came back, but like, I, I know that much. I also know that suggesting or saying anything against the Hulk will get me mean DMs for three years straight, but hey, okay, at least you love Squirrel Girl. But still, her fighting Galactus is pretty ridiculous. You have to admit, okay? It's, it's, Pretty freaking nuts. Yes, I made the pun. In its seven composite Superman, introduced in World's Finest Comics, number 142 from June of 1964, Joseph Meek was a former high diver who had fallen on difficult times. If not for Superman's timely intervention, Meek would have perished. So grateful for the rescue, he was offered a job by Superman at the Superman Museum, where he worked as a custodian. However, his bitterness lingered, extended by the constant reminder of Superman's achievements surrounding him. So one fateful night while Meek was cleaning near statuettes depicting the Legion of Superheroes, a lightning bolt struck that display, somehow imbuing Meek with the combined powers of the Legionnaires. Adopting the name Composite Superman, Meek threatened to expose the hero's secret identities, which he had learned through use of his telepathic powers, unless he actually was accepted into the League. Though Superman and Batman initially struggled against Meek's overwhelming powers, they soon discover his true goal, which was world domination. While unable to defeat Meek outright, the heroes persisted, eventually realizing that his combined powers were only temporary. With this revelation, they managed to overcome composite Superman, thwarting his bid to take over the world. But come on, fighting a person that is half you, half your friend is the weirdest thing that I think you could ever experience, okay? If you think of something weirder, let me know. And it's six, Spider-Man vs. King 
Kingpin. Spider-Man was in a weird place during the Civil War arc in Marvel Comics. After revealing his identity to the public, he was at odds with Tony Stark over the Superhuman Registration Act, which made Peter Parker a wanted man. On the run, Peter, Aunt May, and Mary Jane had hid in a rundown motel while he was a fugitive. However, when Kingpin hired a hitman on Spider-Man, it resulted in Aunt May accidentally being shot, leaving her critically injured. Peter would give her a blood transfusion, and while she was in a coma, he went after Wilson Fisk. Peter confronted the mob boss in prison and gave him a fate worse than death. He defeated him in front of everyone. Peter beat Kingpin to a pulp, but refused to kill him at that moment because he realized that the supervillain living with everyone knowing he can be beaten was better than ending his life. But he also mentioned that if Aunt May did die from being shot, he would come back and fill his lungs with webbing and watch him suffocate, which is incredibly dark, but also makes sense, okay? I, I get where he's coming from. I'm surprised he didn't say something like he would pull his face off by just like not stopping the stick of his hands against his bald head, but hey, that's just my thinking. I'm more brutal. Watching him suffocate probably feels better anyway. But like, yeah, that's messed up. Come on. I'm gonna fill your lungs with webbing. God! Venom? Halfway through into number five, kryptonite chewing gum. Yes, this is actually a thing. The Justice Buster Batsuit is a mech suit part that's part of Batman's Fenrir contingency that's designed to take down the entirety of the Justice League, making its feature appearance in Batman Endgame when the Joker used his virus to warp the brains of the Justice League at the beginning of his Endgame plot. Batman was forced to use the Fenrir protocol to take out his teammates. The suit was successful in eliminating Wonder Woman, Flash, and Iron Aquaman, but met an even match at the hands of Superman. After a lengthy fight, Superman tore through the armor and nearly killed Batman until Bruce used kryptonite chewing gum to spit in Clark's face, rendering him unconscious. Come on! Okay, imagine waking up to learn that you passed out because Batman spit on your face. Like seriously, bro, please. Like, brush your tongue when you're, when you're brushing your teeth, okay? Your breath is absolutely lethal. Not to mention that he had a miniaturized red suns for knuckles. He also had ancient Greek supernatural weaponry, super fast servers, and electromagnetic nerve trees for the, a sensor array. But like, still, kryptonite chewing gum, that's the one thing that I don't think anyone would actually believe, but it did happen. Not, not kidding, it happened. In it four versus their universe. The brothers stand as cosmic beings representing the DC and Marvel universes, symbolizing the vast multiverses that they embody. These entities possess such immense power that even the Living Tribunal and Spectre pale in comparison. While referred to as brothers, they transcend traditional family, okay? They're, they're just cosmic beings. During the dawn of existence, the brothers encompass the entirety of everything except for each other. This lack of individuality became intolerable, igniting a fierce conflict conflict between the two. Their battle unleashed forces that brought about the end of creation itself, followed by a grand rebirth. In this cataclysmic cycle of renewal, the brothers were torn asunder and their existence scattered throughout the newborn universe, splintering it into a multiverse. Fragments of their existence are dispersed in all directions as the expanding universe is unfolded, and through the process they lost their consciousness and sense of identity, requiring eons to recollect themselves. Literally, it's like me after I'm social for like a day. I have to I have to recollect for eons. But yeah, they were villains in the DC and Marvel Amalgam Universe storyline. Spider-Man was literally fighting his universe, which is pretty ridiculous. So I think it deserves to be on the list. Getting close to the end, in number three, Batman versus Hulk. Talk about one-sided fights, right? Okay, like Batman standing up to Superman is one thing. They share a universe. Yeah, you can have kryptonite chewing gum, whatever. But Batman Batman and the Hulk have actually gone toe to toe. Surprisingly, Batman achieved the seemingly impossible feat of defeating the Hulk in the harmonious days of 1981, when DC and Marvel were on friendly terms and the concept of separate universes hadn't really emerged. They occasionally collaborated on crossover stories. One such amusing tale unfolded in DC Special Series number 27, written by Len Wein and illustrated by Jose Luis Garcia Lopez. In this extraordinary encounter, Batman 
Batman unexpectedly crossed paths with a rampaging Hulk. Manipulated by the Joker to view Batman as an adversary, the Hulk turned his fury towards the Cape Crusader. Batman, recognizing the immense power of his opponent, uh, you know, a giant green monster, he somehow still skillfully evaded Hulk's thunderous blows with every move that he could muster. And then, with calculated precision, Batman deployed a pellet of knockout gas, which was kind of disorienting the Hulk. But since he wouldn't actually, you know, deal with it because he wasn't breathing, the Batman swiftly in kicked him in the stomach, okay, which ensured his victory because the Hulk had to inhale the gas. Yeah, that's right. Batman kicked the Hulk in the gut so bad it actually made him flinch. How the actual f does that make any sense? Please. Someone explain it to me. But ultimately, in at number two, Juggernaut Bullet. In the pages of Sins of Sinister number one, jumps us forward a few years to see how the Marvel Universe has changed. Sort of similar to how Endgame jumps five years into the MCU future. In a complex web of manipulation, Mr. Sinister orchestrates a grand scheme to frame the X-Men as Earth's greatest heroes, targeting anti-mutant organizations like Orkies and implicating the Avengers. Among his concerns is the formidable Thanos, who Sinister plans to neutralize with a secret weapon, a physical controlled juggernaut. It's a freaking juggernaut bullet, okay? And a pivotal moment showcases a small yet powerful juggernaut propelled through Thanos' skull via a temporal cannon crafted by Forge. The impact scatters fragments of juggernaut's brain matter across two billion years of history, but the story doesn't end there. No. In Nightcrawler's number three, set in a new timeline created by Sinister's machinations, it is revealed that most of the spirits of vengeance have departed Earth, forming their own hive of malevolence, but Banshee, okay, bonded to a spirit of vengeance, explains to Mother's soul that they have infiltrated traded the mighty Galactus, driven by his insatiable hunger for revenge against those who tainted reality. Unexpectedly though, the same juggernaut bullet that struck Thanos and altered history now targets Galactic Ghost Rider. Over the course of a thousand years, juggernaut hurls through space, gaining momentum, and blows right through Galactus's entire being, and blows up a vault. It's nuts. And finally, in number one, Archie versus Punisher. The Punisher is truly a man who never backs down and punishes those that he must, or thinks that he must, okay? And we even see this bizarrely enough reflected in his interaction with the comic of Archie Andrews. Punisher is willing to venture into all kinds of different worlds in order to apprehend a criminal, but he succeeds this time after mistaking Archie for a criminal. But that of course is too easy when you consider how, you know, Archie's a dude. Punisher is committed to catching the evildoer and resorts to food fight tactics, yes. And for Frank Castle, who often prefers lethal means, you bet that's a commitment. That's absolutely ridiculous. Punisher got into a food fight with Archie. That's it. Just end the video there. Like, what the hell? What the f- A food fight. <laughs>